let's talk about storage interfaces. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the different ways that we can connect hard disk drives to the motherboard in our PC system. Let's start with the Enhanced IDE Parallel ATA standard. Both of these descend from an original specification that's quite old called the IDE specification. IDE was an early standard that was used to connect hard disk drives to a motherboard system. Now the key thing that you need to remember with IDE is that it moves the controller from the motherboard to the drive itself. Every IDE drive you work with has the hard disk controller built into each hard disk drive. Now older standards that came before IDE used a controller that was installed on the motherboard itself. With IDE we took the controller off the motherboard and moved it on to the hard disk drive. Now the actual IDE standard was only implemented for a very short number of years. It had some serious limitations. One of the key limitations was on the size of the hard disk drive that you could use with the standard. It's only a little over 500 megabytes, which is way too small for what we need. Over the years, newer versions of IDE were uh, introduced. EIDE, which is called Enhanced IDE, and PATA, or Parallel ATA. Now, Parallel ATA is an updated, newer version of Enhanced IDE, and Enhanced IDE is an updated, enhanced version of the original IDE. You probably won't deal much with IDE or EIDE drives anymore. Everything that you're going to be working with will probably be Parallel ATA. However, because these are all in the same family, if you're working with an old, ancient IDE drive or an enhanced IDE drive, which were around in the early 90s, or a PATA drive, which we're using now, all these will be collectively referred to in the industry as just simple IDE. Now, even if you're using a new parallel ATA-133 drive, most of the time, folks will still call it an IDE drive because it's descended from the original IDE specification. So don't let that throw you. Folks are kind of generic in the industry. Instead of being really specific about what type they're using, they just call them all IDE drives. Now, whether you're working with a brand new parallel ATA drive or an older EIDE drive or an ancient IDE drive, you're still going to be dealing with the concept of IDE channels. If you're dealing with an old IDE system, which you probably will never see ever again, you have a single IDE channel in the system. If you're dealing with enhanced IDE or parallel ATA, you have two channels. In an IDE system, and when I say IDE, I'm talking about this family generically, whether it's PATA or EIDE, you can have a maximum of two hard disk drives attached to each channel. Now, for example here, I have an IDE channel here, and I can connect a hard disk drive to a ribbon cable right here, and I can connect a hard disk drive to a ribbon cable right here. Because we have two different channels, we have to di differentiate between which one is which. On an IDE system, we have the primary channel, and we have the secondary channel. If you take a look at any motherboard that has an IDE interface built into it, which most of the ones that you will buy off the market will, you will see that there are two IDE connectors on the motherboard. And they have pins in here, 40 pins to connect your IDE ribbon cable. One will be the primary, one will be the secondary. Depending on the motherboard manufacturer, they might list this in a variety of different ways. Some of them might just spell out primary and secondary. Some of them will label it IDE0, which is the primary, and IDE1, which is the secondary, so primary and secondary. The important thing to remember when you're dealing with IDE is that although you have two different channels, the devices that are connected to the same channel share the same bus. Now, in a parallel ATA system, you have actually 80 wires in this ribbon cable. On an enhanced IDE or an IDE system, you only have 40. But the important thing to remember is that those wires that are built into this ribbon cable are shared by both devices on the system. One is configured to be a master device. One is configured to be a slave device. What does that mean? Well, remember back up here we said that with an IDE system that the controller is built into the drive itself instead of in the motherboard? When we enable a device to be a master device, we enable the controller on that particular device. If we configure an IDE device to be a slave device, then 
the IDE controller on that device is turned off. And the IDE controller on the master device controls the drive down here where the controller is turned off. Any given IDE channel can have a maximum of two devices attached. And they can be any type of device that supports the IDE interface. They could be hard drives. They could be CD or DVD drives. Those are the most common ones you'll run into. It could even be a tape drive for backups. Any of these devices, as long as they have an IDE interface, can be connected to an IDE channel. On the given IDE channel, you must have one and only one master. You cannot have two drives on the same IDE channel that are both configured to be master drives, nor can you have two drives that are configured to be slave drives. You must have at least one and only one master device on a given IDE channel. Now, because we have two channels, a primary and a secondary, in a PC system, we can actually install second ribbon cable and connect two more IDE devices to that ribbon cable. Because you can have two IDE channels in a given system, and each channel can have two different devices, you can have a maximum of four IDE devices in a given IDE system. With that in mind, let's look at another storage interface, and that's called the Serial ATA interface. Now, Serial ATA is a newer version of IDE, and it's very, very fast. Let's take a look at how SATA works. Now, Serial ATA is the latest version of IDE. However, there's a great deal of difference between the IDE, Enhanced IDE, and Parallel ATA standards, and the Serial ATA standards. One is the manner in which it transfers data. Instead of transferring data in parallel fashion, because IDE, Enhanced IDE, and Parallel ATA, PATA, transfer data over a series of wires in parallel like this. Well, Serial ATA, and this seems counterintuitive at first, Serial ATA does not use parallel transfer of data. Instead, it uses a single wire that transfers data in a serial fashion. And at first thought, you might be thinking, wow, that ought to be a lot slower than a parallel because this one's transferring multiple bits at a time, whereas the serial is transferring one at a time. Because of the way the signaling works on a serial ATA system, you can actually transfer data faster, one bit at a time, then you could, on an older IDE or PATA system, or enhanced IDE system, transferring multiple bits at a time. The fastest speed you can get with a parallel ATA, remember, was 133. Well, with serial ATA, the speed started around 150, and they just go up from there. Another key difference between serial ATA, which, by the way, is usually abbreviated SATA, is the fact that each device in the system has its own channel. So if I were to install a hard disk drive, an SATA hard disk drive, and an SATA CD drive, instead of putting them on the same bus as we did with IDE, Enhanced IDE and Parallel ATA, each device in the system gets its own channel. And that helps enhance the speed because there's no contention for the data bus. We don't have to say, okay, wait, I can't transfer my data yet because the slave device over there is actually transferring its data. As soon as it's done, then I'll transfer my data. We don't have any of that with the serial ATA system because every device has its own channel. Now, Enhanced IDE, Parallel ATA, and Serial ATA are all descendants of the same original IDE standard. They're all really in the same family. There is another family of storage interfaces, however, that you need to be aware of. Now, it's not as widely implemented as the IDE family. In fact, it's even older than the IDE family but it works very well for specific applications, and that's called the SCSI, or Small Computer System Interface Storage Standard. SCSI is used mostly in servers. You usually don't see SCSI implemented on desktop systems. Let's take a look at how SCSI works. And by the way, in the industry, it is pronounced SCSI. If you go up to somebody and say, I need an SCSI hard disk drive, They'll probably look at you funny for a second before they figure out what you're talking about. If you go up to them and say, I need a SCSI hard disk drive, they'll know immediately what you're talking about. Now, with SCSI, we have a card that's installed in the PC system. And this card is the SCSI controller. And this is a difference between SCSI and IDE. Remember with IDE, the controller itself actually resides on the drive itself. Not so with SCSI. With SCSI, we have 
a card, or it could be a built-in interface. Some of the boards have it built in. Most of the time, though, you'll install a card. And this card controls all the SCSI devices in the system. In a manner similar to IDE, we have a ribbon cable coming out here like this, and this ribbon cable is used to connect the devices. Now, a difference here between SCSI and IDE is the number of devices we can connect to that ribbon cable. Remember, with IDE, we can only connect a maximum of two different devices to the channel, right? With SCSI, we can connect either eight or 16. There are a variety of different standards. The older ones only support eight devices. The newer standards support up to 16 devices, all connected to the same ribbon cable. In fact, we can connect external devices as well. There's usually a port on most SCSI controllers, and we can connect devices on the outside with a cable as well, just like we could connect devices such as an external hard disk drive. There are a lot of SCSI scanners around. Occasionally, you'll even find a SCSI printer. All these devices can be connected with an external cable. Internal devices like an IDE drive, a tape drive, or a CD drive can be connected on the ribbon cable. So we have our connectors right here and here and here, all the way along the cable. And we connect our hard disk drive here, we connect our CD drive here, and so on. When we do this, what we have then is a SCSI chain. It's a chain of devices. All these devices share the same data bus. Now, it's important to understand that each device on this chain has an identifier called the SCSI ID number. For example, we have a hard drive over here. We need, because it's a part of this SCSI chain, we need to provide a way to identify this device on the chain. This is how the SCSI controller decides where data is coming from and where it needs to go to. So we've got this hard drive out here. We might give this hard drive a particular number. We might give it a number of zero, or and maybe come down here to our CD drive and give it an ID number of one. It's important to understand that the SCSI controller is also a device on the chain, just like the hard drive, just like the CD drive. So it needs an ID number two. It could be seven or six or something like that. It's important to understand that the numbering, when we say we can have eight devices and we're using SCSI ID numbers, that the numbers range from zero to seven, not one to eight. Or if we have 16, it goes from zero to 15. And it's also important to understand that the number we use does not reflect the device's location in the chain. A lot of folks, when they're starting to work with SCSI for the first time, make that mistake. They think, well, okay, I've got the hard drive out here on this plug on the end, so it has to be zero. And this CD-ROM drive is connected to the next plug, so it has to be one. No, it does not matter. I could put the hard drive down here and configure it to be one, put a CD drive over here, configure it to be three, and that's okay. This ID number does not indicate its location on the chain. What it does is set the priority of the device. In simple terms, the lower the number, the higher the priority, which is kind of counterintuitive, but once you get used to it, it makes sense. For example, in this situation, I have a hard drive that's configured with an ID number of zero, and I have a CD drive that's configured with a number of one. That means the hard disk drive has a higher priority, which is what we want, on the SCSI chain than the CD drive. Notice down here we set the SCSI controller at number seven. By default, usually the SCSI controller is set to the lowest priority number on the SCSI chain. There's one more concept you need to be aware of when you're dealing with SCSI, and that's the concept of termination. Notice here we have a chain of devices. We have the hard drive on this end, we have a CD, a SCSI controller in the middle, and over here we have a scanner, let's say, at the other end. When you're dealing with SCSI, both ends must be terminated. Now, in this SCSI chain, we need to terminate this end, put a T here for termination, and we need to terminate this end. What does termination mean? And essentially, what happens when we terminate a device, we configure it to be the end of the chain, and special resistors are enabled that electrically tell the system that it's the end of the SCSI chain. You must have both ends terminated and nothing in between. If I were to enable termination on the CD drive, then, because it comes before the hard disk drive, the controller will think that the end of the SCSI chain is here and may or may not see the hard disk drive out here. With older controllers, it wouldn't even see the hard disk drive if you had termination enabled here. 
newer controllers will still see the hard drive, but it'll kick up an error message saying, you know what? You've got a device enabled out on the end of the chain past the point where termination's turned on, and you need to fix that. Now, many times, if you don't have an external device connected out here, the SCSI controller will be the end of the device, and you'll terminate it here. In fact, most controllers have termination enabled by default. If you connect a device out here, you need to disable termination on the controller, enable termination on the external device, otherwise you might not be able to see this device out here. Back in the early days of SCSI, this could be a challenging process because all the termination had to be manually configured. And it never failed that you'd put a CD drive or something on the chain like right here and forget to look at termination, and sure enough, termination was on, and then you couldn't get to your hard disk drive. That happened all the time. Newer SCSI controllers with newer SCSI standards actually have a thing called auto termination, where the controller and the devices work together to sense who's at the end of the bus and then automatically turn termination on so that you don't have to manually do it. Now, as I said earlier, very rarely will you find SCSI implemented on a workstation system. Most of the time, SCSI is implemented in servers only. Occasionally, you'll run across a higher-end workstation system that will use SCSI. Why don't you use SCSI in workstations? Is it better than IDE? Is IDE worse? Or, you know, what's, what's the difference between the two? Why would we put SCSI in servers but not really in workstations? Well, there's, there's a couple of different factors you have to keep in mind. First of all is cost. SCSI devices and controllers, cables included, cost a lot more than IDE by a significant factor, like two to three times as much as a comparable IDE device. However, SCSI systems tend to have slightly higher performance than IDE systems. Now, newer IDE systems are getting really fast, especially serial ATA systems, extremely fast. And in fact, many times faster uh, as far as rated speed than a comparable SCSI system. So why don't we go with serial ATA? Well, some systems do, but SCSI is hanging around because it performs better under load meaning that if I have a server system that's getting hit all the time with network requests to read and write files, SCSI's going to handle that load better than most ATA IDE type systems. Another issue is sheer number of devices. Remember with an IDE system, if we're using a parallel ATA or EIDE, we have a maximum of four devices that we can install in the system. Now for a workstation system, four is plenty. For a server, that might not be anywhere near enough. With a SCSI system, we can have upwards of 16 different devices all connected to the same controller. Which one's best? That's one of those things you have to decide for yourself. A given system might perform best with an IDE hard drive, and another system that's being used in a different way might perform best with a SCSI system. Now, there's one more type of device we need to talk about here, and that's external devices. Now, an external storage device can connect to your PC system usually in one of two different ways. You can have a USB interface or a FireWire, an IEEE 1394 interface. Now, back in the late 1990s, there were external hard disk drives available that ran through your parallel port. Occasionally, you might run into one. However, they were kind of short-lived. USB and 1394 worked so much better that as soon as they became available, you pretty much saw the parallel port variety just disappear off the market. Now, an interesting thing to note with externals is that you have two different real storage mediums you can use. You can have a hard drive or a flash device. If you're dealing with an external hard drive, essentially what you have is a hard drive enclosure or case, and the actual hard drive resides inside of it. And if you take a look, more than likely, it's an IDE or parallel ATA hard drive. In fact, it's probably just a generic off-the-shelf parallel ATA hard disk drive. But what it has right here is the IDE interface that converts into a USB interface or 1394, and it connects to your PC using either a USB port or a FireWire port. So if you actually open them up, there's really nothing special about them. It's a regular old parallel ATA hard disk drive that has an enclosure that has a USB converter in it that converts from the IDE interface to the USB interface right here. Now, for a flash drive, it's a different story. Instead, what we have is a device like this, and inside are memory chips that we store our data on. And it also uses either a FireWire or, more than likely, USB. There aren't very many FireWire thumb drives around that I've seen. Most of them are all USB. And it likewise connects 
into a USB port on your PC. Likewise, you can also have a device called a card reader. There are a variety of different flash storage devices available on the market, especially with digital cameras. And there's about six different, maybe even seven different types of storage device cards that you can use. And a card reader, uh, a nicer one, will have slots that will accommodate multiple different types of flash cards. With a card reader, you insert the card, say from a digital camera, into one of these slots, and then the card reader itself connects via a USB cable into your PC. Once done, you can put the flash device in here, and you can read and write to it just as if it were a hard disk drive or a thumb drive. Now, external storage device interfaces have come a long way. Five years ago, folks looked at them as a novelty. It's like, well, it's neat, yeah, but you know, they don't really work well enough. They're not reliable enough. They don't store enough to really justify buying one. Today, they've become a hot item. Everybody wants one. They all want an external storage device. They all want a, an external hard drive or a flash drive. I'm really curious to see if in the next five to 10 years, if the flash devices will actually start replacing hard disk drives as their capacity and speed increases. In this lesson, we talked about storage device interfaces. We talked about the IDE family. We talked about the SCSI family. We talked about the serial.